everybody. My name is Dr. Scott Giacomucci. I'm a trauma therapy practitioner, educator, and researcher. And I'm the director and founder of the Phoenix Center for Experiential Trauma Therapy in Media, Pennsylvania. So I wanted to create a simple little video here to talk about a three-phase clinical map for working with trauma. And so uh, this is a, a way of conceptualizing, thinking about uh, how to safely and effectively provide trauma-focused services. So there's uh, plenty of modalities that you could look into, and pretty much every trauma therapy modality operates explicitly or implicitly from a three-phase approach, a three-phase model. And so this goes all the way back to 1889 with a... Uh, an author named Pierre Janet. And Janet uh, was the first to propose a three-phase model for safe trauma work. This is later articulated by Ju Judith Herman in her famous book, Trauma and Recovery, by uh, Courtois and Ford in their guidelines for working with complex trauma, complex PTSD. They highly recommend a three-phase uh, approach if you are familiar with EMDR therapy, it uses a three-pronged approach, which is quite similar. Seeking safety, psychodrama, um, most of the trauma therapy approaches and many other therapies uh, just in general are oriented on a three-phase approach. And so in terms of working with trauma, phase one is focused on safety, on strengths, on stabilization, on psychoeducation, providing coping skills. This is where we're building a therapeutic relationship or in a group therapy context, we're developing group cohesion. So phase one really is setting the foundation for the future phases. It's uh, preventing re-traumatization. Oftentimes this first phase gets overlooked uh, in like the therapist or the client's eagerness to jump into talking about the trauma telling stories about the trauma, uh, processing feelings and memories related to the trauma. And when we skip this first phase of the clinical map, we really jeopardize the safety of the treatment. And there's a real risk for re-traumatizing clients or causing more harm than good. So it's really important that we emphasize this first phase of the clinical map, that we're helping clients uh, first, understand what they're experiencing and make sense of, conceptualize uh, what they've experienced, what they're currently experiencing, to have a better understanding of themselves. And so this really helps with normalizing and validating their feelings, their responses, and how, how the trauma has impacted them. In this first phase, uh, it's inherently strengths-based, that we don't... Um, avoid the trauma, talking about the trauma or difficult feelings, but this first phase is really focused on strengths, on resilience. What are some of the strengths that, that the client brings with them that could help them face the trauma when we get to it? This is where we emphasize protective factors. This is where we talk about courage, where we uh, talk about uh, wisdom as a strength, empathy, understanding, self-awareness, and we help clients tap into all the positive internal resources, perhaps even positive memories, before we activate the, the negative and traumatic memories in the second phase. So phase one is about safety, about stabilization, about teaching clients coping skills, about practicing self-regulation, so that when we finish phase one and move into phase two, we can do it in a way that's safe we're prepared for phase two. Now, sometimes we create programs or services that solely focus on phase one. Uh, for example, in uh, higher levels of care in hospital settings, uh, we might not have enough time or we m just might not have you know, the right context to do trauma processing work. We might only have a client with us for a couple days in a inpatient psychiatric setting or hospital setting. And so inherently, the work's going to be more focused on coping skills, psychoeducation, providing referrals for aftercare. 
Although sometimes in our work, uh, especially when we're working with complex trauma or uh, clients who are really dysregulated and don't have a lot of internal or external supports and resources, um, I find this especially true with, with survivors of complex trauma and folks that have experienced really severe neglect and abandonment that we might need to spend extra time in this first phase of the clinical map. Uh, sometimes that means we might spend months, even years, focused on the strength-based work before moving into trauma-focused work. And so as practitioners, we really have to uh, hold this responsibility and acknowledge that this is, this is part of our responsibility in guiding the work, in uh, addressing the the importance of safety and stabilization before doing trauma-focused work, but also in holding the boundary when we have clients who really want to get into the trauma processing work, but who might not have the foundation or stability or safety yet in their life or in the therapeutic relationship where we can do that without risking re-traumatization, without risking the client becoming overwhelmed, without risking creating more harm. And so I find this to be one of the most difficult aspects of doing trauma therapy is really uh, holding that boundary with clients uh, in a way that's ethical, in a way that promotes safety, and uh, in a way that is transparent. And so once we've really established safety, connected with strengths, provided psychoeducation, coping skills, developed a therapeutic relationship, then we can move into the second phase of the clinical map. And this is, this is where we get into the difficult emotions related to the trauma, where we get into memory content related to the trauma, where we really get into processing the grief and loss related to the trauma, the anger, the rage, the sadness, the shame, the guilt, all the difficult emotions and the traumatic memory itself. And so this middle phase is going to look different depending on what modality we're working from. If it's a talk therapy approach, we might be uh, starting to talk through and remember and, and reprocess verbally different aspects of the traumatic memory. If it's a EMDR therapy, that middle phase is going to be uh, applying e the, the EMDR protocol in terms of reprocessing the memory. If we're using psychodrama as our modality, that middle phase might be focused on renegotiating how the trauma lives within us in different trauma-based roles, uh, or yeah, even getting into uh, replaying trauma scenes with safety, strengths, and support, and renegotiating uh, our memory of the trauma in action, creating new endings to the trauma preventing the trauma from happening psychodramatically. Uh, so this middle phase, the trauma processing is going to look different depending on what modality we're working from. And we can't stop there. We have to give consideration to the third phase of the clinical map. And this is where we focus on integration, where we focus on transformation, on post-traumatic growth. This is where we look to the future. So I find uh, many times in trauma work, the focus is on that middle phase, and we tend to underestimate the importance of that first phase and of the third phase of the clinical map. So if we do, if we engage in that first phase, safety, strengths, containment, coping skills, and then trauma processing, we can't just end there. If we end there, we risk the work not having lasting or meaningful change. We have to consider how can we integrate these memories, these roles? How can we transform how the trauma lives within us into something new? How can we redefine who we are as trauma survivors? And how can we grow from this experience? How have we already grown from this experience? How can we make sense of and make meaning of the horrific things we've experienced? and integrate it into a coherent narrative of who we are and our, the timeline of our life. So this third phase of the clinical map is where we look to, 
to integration, transformation, and post-traumatic growth. And so uh, my company name, the Phoenix Center for Experiential Trauma Therapy, is really named after the Phoenix, which is a symbol of this third phase of the clinical map. The Phoenix being the firebird that consumes itself with its own flame and rises from its own ashes. It's a symbol of growth after trauma, of transformation or transmutation. And lucky for us, there's a, a whole field of study about post-traumatic growth, about the different ways that trauma transforms us in positive ways. In the study of post-traumatic growth, they find five different domains, which I really cover in another video uh, on the channel here, which I encourage you to check out. But just the, in general, these five domains, new appreciation for life a new sense of possibility or opportunity in life, uh, a new sense of personal strength after experiencing trauma, a new emphasis or sense of importance in interpersonal relationships, and finally, a new or deepened sense of spirituality or religious connection. So these are the five domains of post-traumatic growth. And we can really think about the, this third phase of the clinical map as embodying those five domains. We could think of those five domains of post-traumatic growth as a template for the different themes, the different tasks, the different goals in this third phase of the clinical map. Uh, a template for trauma recovery, per se, that just like in recovery from substance use, recovery from depression, recovery from medical illnesses, recovery from injuries, recovery from anything, we don't just focus on the problem. We also focus on the solution. We focus on what recovery looks like. And we need to do the same thing in trauma recovery. So I like to think of these five domains of post-traumatic growth as a template for what trauma recovery often looks like. So I really emphasize them in my work. So this third phase of the clinical map provides a sense of integration, a sense of uh, completion, a sense of how do we take what we've experienced in terms of safety, connection to strengths, psychoeducation, coping skills in phase one, integrate that with the trauma processing aspect in phase two, working through the trauma, addressing it head on, and how do we integrate that into the future? How do we take what we've learned and experienced into our lives. How do we grow from this? How do we learn from this? How do we help others now that we've worked through how this has impacted us? And so these are the three phases of the clinical map, phase one, phase two, and phase three. So uh, I really encourage it if you're working with trauma, and even if you're not working with trauma, that you might consider this clinical map as a, a way of structuring and pacing your work. You could think of this in terms of your work over a longer period of time, following these three phases of the clinical map. But I also like to think about each session, whether it's a individual therapy session, a group session, even an educational session or a supervision session, as being guided by these three phases of the clinical map as well. So, add. Uh, this clinical map provides a, a framework, a structure for us in terms of thinking through the logistics and the pacing, not just of the long-term trajectory of our work, but also in terms of the, the timing of our sessions and the way that our sessions are, are structured. So uh, I, I really have learned to adopt this clinical map into every aspect of my work, and it informs everything that I do from organizational meetings to supervision sessions to the way my syllabus is structured in my classrooms, the way that I structure training events, uh, individual therapy sessions, and ongoing group therapy sessions. So there's a lot of value and a lot of utility in learning this clinical map and implementing it into your work. And if I'm being direct and honest too, it also makes planning for a group or planning for sessions a little bit easier because we already have a, a simple framework 
where we're starting, where we're going to get to, and where we need to end. And so I find that just thinking about all of my sessions through the lens of this clinical map makes it easier logistically for me in, in terms of planning and setting up uh, the, set, the session, creating outline for a training group or for an ongoing therapy group is a lot easier because I already have a framework for it. I know I'm starting with safety, cohesion, strengths, education, coping skills. Then I'm moving into the more difficult content, the trauma, the defenses, the difficult emotions, and I'm ending by focusing on growth and integration. So for example, if you're facilitating, say, a 12-week a group, you might break the group up into three different parts, four weeks each. The first four weeks are focused on the first phase of that clinical map, that we're going to devote the first four weeks to establishing safety and connection, group cohesion, focusing on strengths, uh, really providing education, practicing coping skills, tapping into the mutual aid and peer support within the group. Then we move into the middle phase of the group, for the next four sessions, where we really get down to processing the trauma, working through difficult experiences and conflict and resistance, really getting to and moving towards the purpose of the group. And then the last four sessions, the last one third of the group would be focused on integration, on transformation, on post-traumatic growth, and how are we gonna take everything we learned and experienced into the world when this group ends? And so these three phases of the clinical map also mirror and reflect the different phases of group development, beginning, middle, and end in the social work context, uh, which is covered in another video on the channel here. If you're interested in learning more about that, I encourage you to check it out. So um, I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, uh, I encourage you to write in the chat, what was something you learned from this video? What was something that was helpful in this video? What was something you think I missed and forgot to mention in this video? I want to hear about all of that as well. Go ahead and write that in the chat. If you want to be alerted when a new video on the channel gets released, you could hit the subscribe button below. And uh, I hope, I really do hope that you found this helpful and that you find the other videos on the channel helpful. Thanks for watching. <laughs>